Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our series of Lunch with the Friends presentations. It is a, a beautiful uh, late summer day here in Minnesota, so thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Chris Knopp, the Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And for over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been the leader in protecting the Boundary Waters. And we've been that leader because of you. You are the strength of our organization and the key to our success as an organization. Today, the work of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness focuses on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. For the wilderness, there are two minds and one threat to the wilderness. Those uh, two minds that threaten the wilderness are polymet and twin metals, and the threat is acid uh, mine drainage. And, uh, and through lawsuits, legislation, and community action, we are, we are stopping twin metals and polymet in their tracks. It has been a busy time this summer, and it'll be a busy fall as we work to protect the wilderness from the sulfide mines. For people, through our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program, we connect young people to the wilderness through classroom education, and now online programs, and scholarships for wilderness canoe trips. So through that, our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program, we want to ensure that people of all backgrounds can connect to the Boundary Waters. And then finally, community. We understand that Ely, Grand Marais, and the other communities of Northeastern Minnesota have a shared fate with the wilderness. In order for uh, the, uh, the wilderness to be protected, the communities of Ely, Grand Marais, and the others must thrive. And so we uh, are, are proud to work with Ely Community Resource and, and Incredible Ely and, and the people of, of those communities to help make those communities strong. Well, today we have a very, very exciting presentation. And I am uh, so, uh, so glad that, that Kim Young, Kim Young, uh, Quetico Kim Young, our board member, was gracious enough to uh, talk about how to make a, a great, a great meals on your Boundary Waters canoe adventure. She is just back from her latest uh, trip to the, to the Boundary Waters. Uh, she cannot get to the Quetico this, uh, this season, obviously, because of, of the travel restrictions. Um, but, uh, but she has uh, been to the Boundary Waters for uh, 43 years now, and, uh, and she's a seasoned paddler and, uh, um, and uh, um, a seasoned meal maker for having, having uh, great, uh, great trips uh, with, with great meals. Um, a couple uh, housekeeping items before I turn things over to, to Kim. Um, you cannot speak uh, during this, this uh, presentation. However, you can communicate with us, and so if you put your cursor at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see a, a question and answer a button and you'll see a chat button. And so through both those means, you can ask questions uh, during the meal, during the presentation about, about Boundary Waters meals here. And, I can, and I'll save those up and we'll uh, have Kim um, uh, answer those questions at the end of the presentation. And you can also use the chat button to make comments as well. And so, um, I'll, I will turn this over to Kim in a moment. And, you know, I have my, my, my sort of rock gut meals. I have my Cliff Bar here. I have my oatmeal here. And I have my Norse side meal that I uh, often use here. And Kim is going to help, uh, help me up my game in meals and help all of us as well. So I'll turn it over to Kim. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Great. Thanks, Chris. Let's see. So my cursor isn't working. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So thank you, Chris. I'm happy to join you today to talk about some great meals for your future canoe trips. I just got back from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness last week. I spent four days on Knife Lake and one day on Birch Lake with some friends, and we even spent um, one uh, afternoon at Dorothy Moulter's Island, actually for lunch. And we were just channeling her, her strength and her resilience. We were talking about how hard it must have been for her to live on those three islands. And it was just really fun to be there and to see the ribbon rock. So I've been canoeing since 1977. So that is, this is my 43rd year of canoeing. So, you know, cooking good, camping food requires a bit of planning but it's all worth it, so let's get started. So the constant paddling and energy expended on portages equals a really healthy wilderness appetite. 
So do you spend extra time preparing a meal while you're in camp or do you just grab a protein bar or a cliff bar on the go? As you know, everything just tastes better in the outdoors. So no matter whether you leave on a three day trip or whether you leave for two weeks, basic cooking equipment remains more or less the same. Here's a list of the basics that you're going to need. And I'm not going to list off the whole thing for you. You can read that, but I'm going to highlight a few for you. A good stove and a cook kit, cook, cook kit are very, very important. I'm probably on my fifth or sixth cook kit and I've settled on one, which I really love now. But I, and I've settled on my third stove. I use a Snow Peak 2.0 and it uses butane gas canisters. I just love it. Another thing that's really important, if you do go to the Quetico, you need to bring a fire grate with you because they don't have fire grates there on their rock fireplaces. And don't forget your water filter as you're going to need to use filtered water for most of your recipes that you'll be cooking. And one thing that's really helpful is to have a small plastic tablecloth in camp and on your day trips. So a few things that make a difference on how much food to buy is like how many people are involved in your trip and what kind of eaters are they? Younger people and men eat larger quantities of food and they metabolize it more quickly. And I'm sure you all realize that. Once I was part of a group of eight women and two teenage girls and we ran out of food on the last night. I couldn't believe it. We, I just didn't realize how much they ate. So consider that, you know, that's a really important aspect. And another thing you might want to do is consider fresher frozen meat on the first uh, night for your first meal. It's really kind of a treat to do that. And another important question is to ask yourself, can you change your meal from cooking over a fire on, to on the stove and in a frying pan? You might have a fire ban at the last minute. And so you have to make sure that you can cook all or some of your meals on the stove. You can always throw in a box of macaroni and cheese or two. I've done that in the past. So on the trip I just took last week, I was one of four women and we're all healthy eaters. And we were out for four nights and for five days. And so we met ahead of time and we chose the four dinners that are on the slide with two extra meals. We did a fish meal and a soup meal as extra. Our breakfast and our lunch are almost the same every time with the exception of pancakes and hot couscous for breakfast. And I just wanted to show you this. I found this in a book and it's a food list from a 16 day canoe trip in the 1930s for two gentlemen who are going to Algonquin Provincial Park, which is in the Eastern side of Ontario. I copied this word for word from the list and on the, the fifth item on the list is Clem and I couldn't figure out what it was, but it's milk spelt backwards. So it was powdered milk and it was used at logging camps and it was made in Toronto, Canada. So this is quite a different list. Can you imagine bringing four pounds of butter and seven pounds of bacon? The only thing that's on this list that I actually bring are chocolate bars and prunes. Go figure. So after I shop, this is what my dining room table looks like. I separate everything into breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And this picture is before I recycle all the packaging because that just takes up a lot of space and a lot of weight. I put the fresh food in the Ziplocs and into the refrigerator or the freezer. I do separate dinners. I put those in separate Ziplocs. I cook my eggs at the last minute to make hard boiled eggs. And you can bring fresh eggs if you'd like to. And I put the salsa in the Nalgene's at the last minute. I use salsa for chips and salsa and I use it for the quesadillas that I'll be showing you how I make. So some items actually stay in the same original packaging like the hash browns shown here. I mixed the, all the gorp in a bowl and then I made it equal. I put it in Ziplocs and I put everyone's name on it so they have their own gorp bag. So with the Zatarain's yellow rice, I cut out the directions and taped it to the packaging and I made sure that I labeled it correctly. And in the bacon um, picture, I just disposed of the bacon because you can see the bacon. So Basically, you can make some really elementary meals or you can use a food dehydrator to allow you to bring some hamburger with you. 
So I'm going to show you the process to dehydrate hamburger. You cook it, you rinse it very, very well because you have to get all of the fat off of it and it will keep much longer without any fat on it. In my, in my case, I put it on a paper towel on the dehydrator tray. I put it in the dehydrator for four to eight hours. I just check it every once in a while on, and then you put that on high. You do meat on high, you do herbs on low. So notice how small it gets, it gets dry and it gets sharp. And when it's done, I put it in a Ziploc. I've tried putting it in the vacuum sealer bags, but it's so sharp and pointy that it just, it just loses the seal. So I don't even try to do that anymore. So you can use this dehydrated hamburger for spaghetti, for tacos, for chili, for pizzas, just about anything you can think of. I just learned recently about boiling the meat in water and then you could rinse it off and then you could dehydrate it. So that would really get the fat out also. So the story about my dehydrator kind of looks like an old microwave. I bought it um, when I lived in Rochester, Minnesota. I went to the Olmsted County Fair. I went up to the person who was selling it and she thought I was too young to buy it. It cost about $150 at the time. And I said, no, I have a job. I can pay for it. I wrote around a check. I've been using it every year since. There are newer dehydrators on the market that are circular, that are see-through, they're really nice. And I've been seeing a lot of them at garage sales lately for like $10. So if you really wanna try dehydrating on the cheap, you could go to some garage sales and you'll probably find one. So I also use the vacuum food sealer and I did some tomato paste and some pizza sauce this year. In order to vacuum seal a liquid, you have to actually freeze it first and then you can seal it and then you can just let it thaw. And I put it in with the respective meals in their own Ziplocs. So it worked out really good this year. It was really great. You want to repackage your liquids in plastic Nalgene bottles and you want to put those in Ziplocs. And I always double Ziploc the homemade syrup, of course, that always tends to leak for, leak for some reason. Then make sure you label them because if you're the only person preparing the food, the other people aren't going to know when they're trying to help you prepare the food in a camp what it is. So just label it. It's very easy. So breakfast, we're going to talk about breakfast first. And one of the things we do, we have on hand for breakfast is instant oatmeal. We bake pancakes usually once or twice if it's a longer trip. We have coffee and tea. We do English muffins with jam and peanut butter. We always have dried fruit. One of the things that I really like though is that pre-cooked bacon and it's really good with pancakes and you could eat it with fish if you catch fish in the morning. It really limits the amount of smell of bacon in camp and you don't have all that fat to clean up or try to get rid of. So pre-cooked bacon, I really highly recommend it. Breakfast bars are great for the last morning when you want to get a fast start to get back to your ending point and you may or you could end up um, by upping your game and making scones for breakfast. And I'll show you how I did that in a few slides from now. Here's the pre-cooked bacon. You just heat it up in a pan and set it aside in a container that will keep it warm. And then you can make your pancakes. And if you're lucky to have found some wild blueberries in camp or some walleye from the lake, you can add that to your plate also. Well, blueberry season was not very good this year. And so I knew that ahead of time and I brought dehydrated blueberries with me and we added them to our pancakes and we added them to the scones that I made. And it was delicious. So when I take a tow at the beginning of a trip, I have to have a quick breakfast. So one of my friends, Kathy, made the homemade muffins and I had made the hard boiled eggs and then we had some coffee. And that was a great way to start our first morning. We didn't have to spend it in a restaurant or making breakfast, things like that. And on our last morning, we had the hot couscous with fruit and coffee. And that was the first time I made that and I'll show you how I made that. So I used the couscous and the hot and the dry fruit already mixed up together in a Ziploc. And then I made this cozy and I learned how to make a pot cozy, but from watching a video um, by, from a gentleman named Kevin Outdoors. 
And a cozy is made of the material called reflectix, reflectix that actually insulate pipes. And then with a little aluminum tape, you can actually fashion a pot cozy from your pot. And this allows you to rehydrate your food with boiling water without having it sit on the stove for so long. So I just added boiling water to the couscous and I put the cozy top on and we waited 10 minutes and we had a rehydrated great couscous meal. We had way too much, but actually it was my first time using it and it was great. I just loved it. So if you wanna check out how to make one of these cozy pots for your pot, go to Kevin Outdoors and he's got a multitude of videos on dehydrating food and making a pot cozy. It's really good. So here's some of our breakfast choices just on the plastic tablecloth. And there's instant oatmeal. There's lots of coffee choices these days. You can bring flavored coffee. Or you could um, bring Bob's Red Mill Muesli, which is great for larger groups instead of the individual oatmeals. It just depend, depends on your what you want to do. So we're going to go on here and we're going to talk about lunch. So lunch for us is basically make your own that's on the tablecloth. We put it all out there. Some people might want to have beef jerky. Some people might want to have cheese and crackers. One of the things we really like is pita bread with tuna fish. So I buy the mayonnaise packets at the deli and you mix it into the tuna fish packet. And then you can get two or three pita breads out of there, half of the pita breads. Um, so you can also bring mustard packets if you want. You could put the uh, tuna fish on crackers or you can do the cheese. We also bring carrots and snap peas and radishes and you could bring some other fresh veggies cut up if you wanted to, and those last two or three days. And that's really a treat to have those fresh veggies the first few days of your trip. An in-camp lunch, lunch might be like having a soup, and especially if it's raining out. We've also had bagels and cream cheese, and sometimes I have friends that bring the, the salmon in the foil, and they make like a bacon, or excuse me, a bagel, cream, cheese, salmon, and sometimes they put onions on it. I mean, you, there's just unlimited possibilities of what you can do with these foil meats and with bagels and cream cheese. So here's the tuna and the chicken in foil, just a little more close up so that you can see that. And I wanted to let you know that you can readily find the tuna fish in the grocery stores, but the the chicken is harder to find these days and I actually had to order it online. And so I, I bought six and that should be good um, for a couple of trips. And the other thing that I bought brought this time with me is I didn't bring a big jar of peanut butter, I just brought the GIF to go. And so if you know you're not gonna have a lot of peanut butter eaters, you can bring a small thing like that. And you can also get mayo, or excuse me, tartar sauce at the deli and that is really good with your fish. Be sure and make sure that your lunches are easy to bring with you on your day trips. So here's a wonderful view from the top of Thunder Point on Knife Lake. I first stood atop Thunder Point on 1977 on my very first trip, and I was just there last Wednesday. It's just a beautiful view. I met lots of people from all over the country last Wednesday and throughout the week. Lots of people are enjoying the Boundary Waters and they're just not from Minnesota. They're from all over the place. Well, let's go on to appetizers. And some people are probably saying, appetizers? Why would I do that? Well, I'll tell you what. 20 years ago, one of my friends, Russ, brought Asiago cheese and water crackers on the trip. And we were like, this is it. We love this. We're bringing this every time. And so then we thought, well, you know, we should have some more appetizers with happy hour. And so we came up with blue chips and salsa and the just pretzel sticks one night. But the best one, my friend Diane came up with fresh bruschetta with toasted French bread and mozzarella cheese. And that's a staple. We do that all the time, usually the very first night. So here's a picture of that very first night. Last week, last Monday night, we were on Knife Lake on Robin Island and we had a beautiful 
view of Knife Lake and we had the, the fresh bruschetta with our wine. And so I, the way I made it is I toasted the bread and cut it at home, put it in a Ziploc. I froze the real mozzarella cheese in with the steaks for the first night in a little like foamy package. And then I brought fresh whole tomato. I brought fresh shallot and then I diced those on site. And then I had oil and red balsamic vinegar separate. So we mixed those. And then I used fresh basil, cut that up from, that was from my garden. And then we chopped and added some minced real garlic. So it's, everything was fresh and we served it on my Helinox table, which I'm gonna talk about in, a, in just a few minutes. It's just really fun. It was a fun way to have happy hour and have a fresh kind of elegant appetizer. So here's the Helinox table and I'm showing you a couple different ways you can use it. You can use it for appetizers. You can use it for coffee bar. It's just really fun thing to have. And sometimes mother nature gifts us with some beautiful tables in our campsites, but a lot of times they don't. So I splurge and I bought this through REI and I use it for every trip, every day. It's really, really nice. So here's a picture of a beautiful rock table that we had on Ensign Lake a few years ago and we had spread out our spaghetti dinner, as you can see. And another way to present your food is to put it on the green tablecloth like I have here in camp. And I think that's breakfast. So, you know, there's lots of ways to pre present your food. The other way is if you haven't used your fire grate, you could present it on your fire grate. So last week on Monday night, our first night's dinner was actually no name steaks with sauteed mushrooms in a wine sauce. And I, then we grilled potatoes with broccoli and onions in foil over the fire. It was one of the best meals I've ever had. I must say I'd never done the mushrooms in a, a redu reduction of, of wine sauce, but it was really easy to do on the stove. We cooked the no-name steaks on the fire and we did the potatoes before we did the steaks. So it all kind of ended up being done at the same time and it was really great. You should try it. So another night we had chicken quesadillas, which has become a staple for us on one of our nights. Somebody came up with it one night. I think it was Kathy Cleary. She, we were just we had, didn't have very much food left over. We had some tortillas left over and some salsa and some chicken and we mixed everything together. We had some cheese and this is what we came up with. I will tell you that you should put the, lay the tortilla out on the griddle and just use half of the tortilla. So you put the chicken and the salsa mixed together on and then you put some cheese slices on and then you fold the tortilla uh, over it. So you can cook it on both sides and you can serve it whole or you can cut it into thirds and use it as little appetizers. Or if you have a big group, that way people can eat some in the beginning and people don't have to wait. It's just really, really great thing to do. And you can do this in a frying pan too. And just put a little bit of oil in your frying pan or on top of your griddle before you cook it so that they, it turns over easily. It's a great, great meal. And we did that with some salad. So one of our most favorite meals is pizza. And I know there's lots of different ways to make pizza, but I'm going to show you how to, the way that I make pizza. We've kind of come up with this over the years. I put everything on a rock to show you, you should get everything set up before you actually try to put your pizza on the, on the fire grate. So I, so we chopped the onions and the mushrooms and we had the sauce ready and we had the cheese ready and we use turkey pepperoni because we think it's a little bit healthier for us. I buy the pizza dough that's like the dollar bag that all you do is add a half a cup of hot water to it. I use two pans, I buy disposable foil pans and I buy two pans for a group of four or five and I usually use three pans for a group from six to nine. And two pizzas was a kind of a lot for us last week but we managed to eat most of it. So, I'm going to play for you a video that is reduced, about a reduced 45 minute spread of how to make the pizza. And we're gonna talk about it after I show you. So here we go. It's on the fire grate. We're putting the sauce on and the toppings. 
And then we're gonna put it back on the fire. And then it's all done. The cheese is melted and we're going to cut it. So what I wanted to show you, what I wanted to talk to you about was First, you have to get everything ready like I described before. And then you have to build your fire and you have to get a lot of good coals going because you want it to be hot, but it can't have flames. So then you want to have a bunch of tinder next to your fire grate so that you can add it in. And so then you make your dough and you let it rest for five minutes. And then you oil the pans and then you spread out the dough and then you put a big piece of heavy duty aluminum foil on it and then you would put it on the fire and you would move it around for about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes and you can check to see if the crust is light brown on the bottom then you can take it off and then you can add your, your sauce and then your toppings and your cheese and then you put the foil back on and then you put it back on the fire. Now in the meantime you might have had to add a few sticks to get your fire going again. And then if you do get a lot of flames, you should have a little cup of water nearby and you can just kind of put out those flames. You just don't want to burn everything, burn the bottom of the crust. So keep moving the pans around for another 10 to 15 minutes. And then when the cheese is all done, melted and hot, you take it off and you serve it. So I'm going to so, um, show you the video one more time and you can kind of see now what I'm talking about. So here we oil the pans, we put the dough in. We cooked the crust, we're putting the sauce on, we're putting the toppings on, we put the cheese on, we put it back on the fire, move it around, check it, and it's ready to serve. It's a really fun meal. So the next meal I'm going to talk about is spaghetti with a meat sauce and a cabbage salad. Now spaghetti is a really nice meal to have towards the end of your trip because you can do it on a stove. We had this last Thursday night. We had one pot for the water and the angel hair, angel hair pasta, which you can, I would say to use that because it cooks a lot faster than regular spaghetti. And then one pot was for the sauce and I used a packet of dry spaghetti sauce. I added the tomato sauce that I had vacuum sealed and I added water and then I added the rehydrated hamburger. We heated that up and then we drained the um, spaghetti and we had some Parmesan cheese for the top of it and I made we made the cabbage salad which works really great because cabbage works um, saves longer and so you can have it towards the end of your trip. So while we didn't have any fish on the trip because we were skunked I admit it we tried not very hard but we tried um, I always bring shore lunch and oil to cook fish with and a little bit of flour. So here's my son, Michael, on Saganagans Lake a number of years ago in the Quetico. And we had lots of fresh walleye. And here he's using the stove, but you can also use it, use um, a fire to cook your fish. Here is an example of that, cooking the fish over a fire in the Quetico. And I recommend this when you have larger groups. When you have five to nine people, it's easier to cook a lot of fish at once over a nice hot fire. And you do need a nice, nice hot fire and get your oil hot first before you put the fire or the uh, fish in there. So I, I always bring a griddle. And do you remember those hash browns I was talking, I showed you earlier? So those hash browns are really nice to use because you put hot water into the carton and let them rehydrate. And then you could spread a little bit of oil on your griddle and you pour those hash browns out and you cook them over a hot fire. And they're great. They're great for breakfast. They're great with your fish. So I always bring a griddle. I'm gonna talk a little bit about salads. We love salads on our trips. We usually have the cabbage salad towards the end of the trip, the last three or four or five nights. Cabbage stays really fresh and then for this regular salad, a lettuce salad, I've been starting to buy those smaller salad bags that you see in the grocery stores now, and they have more shredded lettuce and cabbage and kale in them. And there's lots of different kinds with lots of different dressings. And I've tried those the last three years and I really like those um, well. And we use those the first couple nights. So the thing I'm gonna tell you about salad and about cheeses and your meat the first night is keep your food pack in the shade whenever you can. I know you can't do that when you're in your canoe, but try to do it while you're in camp and keep it in the shade. Just keep moving around. So 
Another thing you can bring are the pre-made soups that are handy to have, especially if it's raining. Most of them like serve eight, um, but those are like one cup servings. The Bear Creek brand is a really good brand to use. You can bring your soup to a boil. I'm gonna show, talk, to you about, talk to you about the chicken noodle soup. You can bring it to a boil and then you can add some Bisquick to make dumplings. So I put Bisquick in a separate Ziploc bag, a small one. Then while you're in camp, add some filtered water, knead it so that it's kind of a dough, and then cut the very end of the Ziploc bag and squeeze it into the top of the soup. You might wanna add a little more liquid to your soup than it calls for, and then put the cover on it and don't peek for about 10 minutes. And you will have just a wonderful chicken noodle soup with Bisquick dumplings. Another great soup is either a potato soup or a wild rice soup, and you could bring more wild rice and cook it and add it. And then you could add a chicken in foil packet and you have a great creamy wild rice chicken noodle soup. Now this picture depicts the Chinese or the Asian salad, I would call it. And we bring up the whole cabbage, we bring up onion, we bring up sesame seeds and then ramen noodle soup and you crunch up the ramens and you, the noodles and you put those in there and then you use the dressing that's in a little packet in the ramen noodle soup mix and it's just some powder and I always buy the chicken by the way and I mix that with oil and vinegar and you have your dressing and it's just a really wonderful salad that you can have towards the end of your trip. And let's not forget about desserts. What can we say about desserts? There's so many different kinds of things you can do. You can bring cookies, you can bring chocolate bars, Fig Newtons. One of the things I've used to bring a lot of, I haven't lately, but it's a, it's a big hit is the instant pudding and you bring some powdered milk with you and you mix it up and you can put it in wax paper cups and you can eat it and then you can just throw it in the fire when you're done. But one of my personal all-time favorites is Lorna Dunes. That's a shortbread cookie that's a little square and we put an Andy's mint in between it and it's really decadent and it's really good. But I have upped my game over the years by buying a lightweight Dutch oven and I've either made um, cake, I've made brownies, I've made cornbread, I've made scones like I did last week. It requires some wood, you need wood to put on the bottom and the top of it and a lot of patience but it's really, really worth it. So if you're base camping, you could bring a regular Dutch oven and cook with it. You could make cooks, uh, cakes and things like that, or you could even make one pot meals. So there, the general Dutch oven is pretty heavy, but you know, if you're gonna base camp, you should consider doing that. So a cliff bar or scones or chocolate cake, what would you like? And then drinks, we should talk about drinks. So some people want their water to be flavored and this Mio flavoring came out a few years ago. It's small, it's really convenient, it's really lightweight and all you do is squeeze, one little squeeze into your uh, cup or into your Nalgene jar or your water bottle and you have some flavoring and it's really good. Now the very first trip I took, I think we took a 10 pound bag of sugar and Kool-Aid and that's how we made our, we had our flavoring. It was so heavy, it was ridiculous. And I actually have brought Tang up until recently because I like Tang, but I don't anymore. I'm just buying the meal and it seemed, everybody really liked it on this trip. And then talk, talking about coffee, remember to bring ground coffee, not whole bean coffee. I did that once. I actually forgot. I wasn't paying attention about whole, whole ground coffee. We got up to Puba Lake and we, so we had to put a little bit of coffee into a Ziploc bag. We took our hatchet and smashed it to get it ground and we called it axed ground coffee. So thanks for listening. And here's a view, another view of Knife Lake last week. It was the only day, it wasn't windy. It was a beautiful day to be on the lake, except for the flies, they were a little bad that day. So there's lots of ways to cook in the Boundary Waters. I hope I've helped you discover a few new ways to cook in the Boundary Waters. And I'd love to hear some of your comments or your questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of them.
Right. Kim, thank you so much for that, that wonderful presentation about making uh, five-star meals in the, in the boundary waters there. And we have uh, lots of questions from folks and, and I encourage people to, uh, to keep uh, asking your, your, uh, your questions and we can, uh, I will ask them of Kim. So, so Kim, um, okay. you know, we have, we have some questions about how long certain foods last uh, in the boundary waters. And, and perhaps if you have, uh, you mentioned trying to keep the pack in the shade as a way of, of making things last longer. But, but the, um, you know, how long do uh, hard, hard boiled eggs last for you in, in the boundary waters? And, and, um, and then how long does salsa last as well? So the hard boiled eggs, we try to eat those up within the first three or four days. And we're very, very careful about trying to keep that in the shade. We can eat, you can eat those for breakfast or for lunch. And the salsa, the same thing. I put it in the Nalgene bottle at the last minute. I keep it in the, in the cooler until we leave on the trip. And we try to usually eat that up within the first three to four days. Good, good deal. And uh, there's a question. Do you ever take a cooler on, on trips to keep things uh, fresh? Oh, sure. I've taken a cooler. We call it the cooler trip. It's a lot heavier. But if you're going to base camp, you certainly can. If you could find a cooler that would fit into a pack so that you could hang it, you know, that's something to consider um, because animals can get into coolers. Raccoons can get into coolers pretty easily. But it, it's a lot easier, yes, if you can bring your, your cooler and bring. Sometimes, years ago, I used to bring dry ice and then you layered it, you put it on the bottom and layered it with newspaper. And that lasts a lot longer than traditional ice. Um, so yeah, we have brought coolers and it, it, it's fun. If you're gonna base camp especially, coolers are fine. And you know, we have, there's a, a, another question came about fresh eggs. Uh, how, how long do you uh, keep fresh eggs up? So I don't generally bring fresh eggs that often, but I have. One time we opened them all up and put them in a Nalgene bottle. And so we used them just for one meal. We made a big um, meal of scrambled eggs. You know, I would say they would probably last a, like that a couple days, but if you kept them in the shells, I think they'd last for quite a while. You know, traditionally eggs are not refrigerated in other countries. Right. <laughs> so if you had those little egg packages, you might be able to, you know, I'd say four or five days probably the hardest thing would be to keep them from breaking mm -hmm. when they're in the shell. And let's see, the, the, the pizza dough, where, where do you get your, your, your pizza dough? So it's right in the grocery store. In the, sometimes there's a pizza spot where there's pizza sauce and pizza crusts. And usually it's in a um, plastic bag, kind of like the, the pancake bag. And it's one crust. And it's usually like a dollar. And so it's right in that general area where they have all the pizza ingredients and mm -hmm. pizza things. And that's what I would bring. I mean, I bring it all the time. And, you know, so it's one bag per boil pan. So if there's a lot of us, we bring three. If there's just more, less of us, we bring two. <laughs> Great. You know, I know a, a few people have asked uh, uh, this question. So we will, we are recording this presentation and we will send out the link to you. So I know a lot of us were trying to take notes as Kim was speaking and, uh, and uh, that way you'll be able to uh, watch this and, 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 and stop it so that you'll be able to uh, um, uh, uh, take, take good notes and, and use the uh, uh, Kim's good advice on your next Boundary Waters uh, trip here. Um, uh, you know, you had a side me a side with your pizza. What was that side that you had with your with your pizza meal there? So that was one of the salads. It was one of the salads. Okay, so you worked right. up a fresh salad there. Right, and again, if if you have paid attention in the last few years, there there's smaller bags. They usually the the lettuce and everything is chopped up a lot more, and there's usually nuts and seeds and things like that, and plus a dressing. And there must be five or six or seven different varieties. And so you can pick the one you really like and just, you know, keep it in your cooler until you go and then keep it, keep your food pack in the shade. Okay. Um, great. Uh, you know, we, you have a, a lot of different things in your, your, your um, food and meal uh, pack there. How much does that weigh, you know, uh, with the, between your, your food and your, your cooking gear and that? Well, we only put 
the food in the food pack. Mm -hmm. So that is probably 50 pounds. It's pretty heavy usually. Mm -hmm. And then I have a blue barrel, which um, a lot of times we'll just put the lunch in. So that breaks it up a little bit. And then when we're stopping to have lunch, we can just grab that blue barrel. As far as all the cooking equipment, things like that, that gets put into two different equipment packs. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, it just gets divvied up in the two different equipment packs. And so, you know, when you have the Dutch oven, it adds a little bit more weight, but it just depends. If you're going to be in camp for half of a day, that's, that's a day you should do something like that. So it's worth it for me to bring the extra weight. If you're going on a really long trip and, and weight is a consideration, well, then you probably don't want to bring the lightweight Dutch oven. Um, and you may not want to bring your griddle. It just depends on, you know, how fast and how far you're going to go. And so you can tailor your meals to your trip too. And uh, the griddle you have here, someone asked the question, where did you get your griddle? Well, I have a couple different kinds and I just, um, I think just in a, just in a camping store. So one of them has a Teflon coating mm -hmm. and you, you can usually get a cover for that too. And then I have an uh, older handmade aluminum one that I really like. And that was made by somebody at a company here in the area and it was handmade. So that, so that's really special to me. Okay. Great. And, you know, some of the things that you had in your food pack were a little softer. Is there a way that you protect your, your, your soft food items from getting squashed? Well, that's a good question. So when we bring the blue chips for the appetizers, I usually put that on the top of the blue barrel so that it can't get squished. And some of the breads that we bring, I try to put those in, in the middle of something and cover it up. And so I do try to, I'm very mindful about that. And you just have to try to surround it with other things and don't put anything really hard next to it. So you, you should be careful when you're packing things like that. You, you might, sometimes you could bring a special, a smaller plastic pack and put some of those things in there um, you could try that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, they've had a few questions about, uh, about, uh, keeping the food away from bears. So what do you do, uh, to, to keep the, the, your, uh, your food, uh, safe from, uh, and away from bears? So traditionally I've hung my pack. It's getting harder and harder to find trees that you can hang your packs in, especially the first few nights when it's so heavy. Um, there's some school of thought that says just, just attach your food pack to a tree and put some pots and pans on it and that the bears can find it there just as easily if you moved it back in the woods 100 yards away from your camp. So I know this year has been a little trickier. There have been more bears around because the berries were really bad. I, I still like to hang the food. And if I can't get it as high as I'm supposed to, at least I'm gonna make it harder for them to get. And um, I try my hardest, I use a pulley system. So I try to put it between two trees. And so um, I, I try to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, in our, our chat function, we've had a, a lot of good ideas for, for making pizzas. There's a, uh, some people have uh, suggested using uh, tortillas, mm -hmm. uh, 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 bubble a bread for, for pizza as, as well, and an mm -hmm. interesting technique for that. And, and some, uh, uh, so there's some, uh, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of different ways uh, for, uh, uh, for to, to make pizza here. So but for those of you uh, 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 that are panelists watching this, you know, take a look at the, the different uh, suggestions in, our, in, the, in the chat section there. There's some really, really good I, I ideas here. You know, we uh, did have a, a question on, uh, on uh, what, 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 do you have a particular water filter that you prefer, uh, Kim, for, for purifying your water? So I have two, two sim, sis, uh, systems. I use the Katadyne uh, base camp water filter that you can hang up in a tree and then you can fill up your water bottles and things like that, fill up pots with water. And then I also, a friend of mine has the Vario by Katadyne 
and that's a pan pump. And that's a really nice one with a ceramic filter in it besides the regular filter that Katadyne uses. So I really like that one. And it's, it seems to not clog up as fast as the other, the Katadyne Hiker Pro that I have had in the past. I also have a Steri pen, which I can use on the go, which uh, works well. I was gonna say about the pizza also, a couple years ago, I brought up the small individual non breads, N A A N, that Indian bread, and we made pizzas mm. on those, and that was really good. Great, you know, uh, uh, and, and there's a, a couple different techniques for trying to keep uh, our pans from getting uh, uh, blackened by by fires and that. Uh, I mean, some people put soap on the bottom uh, of the pans to to keep them from getting too black. And is there anything that you use uh, when you're when you're out cooking to kind of uh, uh, keep your 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 uh, uh, gear from not getting blackened by the fire? So when I had previous cook kits, I would cook with those over the fire, but I don't do that anymore. So I just use my cook kit on the stove. And I only use my griddle on the fire grate to cook with, or those foil pans. So I, I don't like having to carry the blackened pots. So I, I don't use them on the fire anymore. And I think it makes them last longer to just use them on the stoves. The newer cook kits are really lightweight and, they, and mine is made of titanium. And so I just wouldn't put it on the fire. I've paid too much money and they're really nice and I like to keep them clean. And so I, I just use them on the stove. Otherwise in the previous years, I used to use the soap ahead of time and that works really well. But I think it also, when you're cleaning up, I just think of all that soap and everything that's getting into the ground and, and all that soot. So I, I just don't like to do that anymore. And we have a, a question here about uh, maybe you want to explain about the, uh, the, the, the blue bear barrels, but if you want to explain, explain what, what that is again. Sure. So I have a 60 liter barrel and a, and a 30 liter, liter barrel, and you can buy them at most camping stores, Midwest Mountaineering, REI, and then you have a harness. And so they're hard plastic and they have a cover with a metal locking band on top of it that um, makes it really tight and puts the black lid onto the blue base of the um, barrel. And so they're not technically bear proof. However, they work very, very well. Um, I think a bear would be very hard pressed to open it and he'd probably just roll it around unless he accidentally opened up the metal top. So they're really nice. They're, they transport really easily. For me, the 60 liter barrel gets really heavy. And so I traditionally only bring it with me when I have lots of guys around, they, then they can carry it. Um, but they're really nice. It's an, it's, um, it's an expense at first, but they're really nice and they're waterproof. So nothing is gonna get, going to get wet if you tip or if you drop it while you're unloading your canoe. The barrels are really nice. And the other thing you can use them in camp for is like a little table because the top, you can use it as a cutting board. I really like the blue barrels. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they really work out, out quite well here. Boy, we've had a, 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 lot of, a lot of great questions here. And I know there are, 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 are some more questions here. Uh, Kim, maybe if you want to uh, move the uh, slide presentation down here uh, to the last slide here. And so, uh, if you if you want have uh, some more questions for for Kim, uh, there's her email. She is uh, 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 Quetico Kim there at seventy four at Gmail. So please send her your questions there. Also, Kim, if you want to move the uh, 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 slideshow forward here, I want to. With, I'm so excited about this. We are having our virtual annual gathering September 15th through 17th. So what, on Tuesday through Thursday, we will have 
the show at noon, just like when our lunch with the friends for for uh, 45 minutes or, or an hour, and then one in the evening at seven o'clock uh, each night. So uh, please sign up for those. Uh, Kim will be doing another one on, on cooking as well. And so it'll be an, another variation on the theme here. It'll be a lot of fun here. And so we will uh, cover our, our uh, three programmatic areas of, of people, wilderness, and community. And so uh, in the wilderness, we'll discuss our advocacy work here. We'll have uh, uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, former Governor Arnie Carlson, and uh, former Chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band, Karen Diver, give uh, introductory uh, presentation, uh, introductory remarks before our presentations at noon. And in the evening, we'll have uh, 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 fun presentations about winter camping, about cooking in the Boundary Waters, about spending a great day in Ely, and about um, the author of Gunflint Burning will give a presentation. So we'll have a lot of great, great shows there. And so please, please sign up for those. Those are free. And uh, we'll be sending out more information about that. And uh, I want to thank all of you again. You are the, the strength of uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. You are, you are uh, the reason that the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is permanently protected. And you are the, the key to uh, the success in the future to protecting the Boundary Waters and having more people enjoy it. Um, so uh, from everyone at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, I want to thank you for for uh, sharing your afternoon with us. It was our pleasure to, to give you this uh, lunch with the friends. And so uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Kim, if you would please stop the broadcasting here, we'll uh, let our panelists go and enjoy their afternoon. So thank you everyone again, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.